Hey guys, welcome to System Design Fight Club, uh, live every Saturday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and 10.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, you can join from the um, Zoom link that is in the Discord channel. Today we will be covering uh, Proximity Service, also known as Yelp. Uh, there's really good content on it in uh, Alex Shu's second book, and there's also some coverage of it in grokking the system design interview, but uh, I think the best coverage is probably in Alex Shu's book. There's probably also some great content out there um, on uh, Jordan's YouTube channel, I think, and then um, the Bite Bite Go YouTube channel might actually even have some content on uh, proximity service as well. Uh, we're going to give it a couple more minutes before we get started. All right, we're probably fine to get started. Um, okay, so it's proximity service slash Yelp. Let's go over the uh, functional requirements. Then we're gonna go over non-functional requirements, and then we'll do some numbers. Okay, functional requirements. Um, we're going to allow uh, allow um, new business locations to be added. Um, allow users to search for nearby locations. Um, the best way to summarize this uh, question, I'd say, is that um, let's say that you want to find K nearest gas stations. And it's like on, on Google Maps or something. So a couple of other uh, good problem names is probably uh, Google Maps. Uh, I think a different problem would actually be find nearby friends or Uber backend. I think those have a higher write volume and that's how those questions would be distinguished. Um, anyways, uh, allow users. So this is gonna be lower write volume than you'd see with other problem use cases. Um, so that kind of distinguishes this from that, how the others would be handled. I haven't looked into the, um, higher write volume scenarios, but I think that might result in a different uh, kind of approach to the problem. Um, so uh, low write volume here, um, this is gonna happen at a lower frequency, uh, allow users search for nearby locations. So there's gonna be very high read volume. It's very unbalanced. And um, I think that's it. Oh, it's like view business information for the, uh, for the locations. So it's like view business information for the um, nearby locations. We also kind of want to support updating that. And that is a little bit more distinguished from adding new business locations. We'll see that later. Uh, allow businesses to update their information. Non-functional requirements. Um, so low latency reads, low latency reads. Um, 
for fetching the locations and low latency for viewing business information. Um, and uh, high availability is very important. And then um, we don't, we, we can wait like a whole day or something for the updated uh, information to get added. Um, so uh, stale reads are 100% okay here. Um, so uh, it's, it's not gonna be a high consistency system. It's, it's definitely um, more on the availability side than the consistency side. Okay, uh, yeah, and so um, the read data can be up to 24 hours stale, possibly even a bit more than that. Okay, numbers, um, so there's a little bit of different numbers for Grocking and Alex Shoe's book. Um, Grocking had a total of, I want to use like the higher numbers of both. Um, so Grocking had uh, 500 million locations. Um, and uh, it also specified 20% growth yearly in number of locations and the um, queries per second year over year. Um, more interested in the growth and the number of locations. So it's like how much data is getting added every day. That could be interesting later on in this problem. Okay. And we're also going to talk about uh, daily active users. So with Alistair, we specified 100 million daily active users and five queries per day. I kind of liked how that was structured. While with Grokking, it just said 100,000 queries uh, per second, which was a bigger number. And I liked that more. Um, so that would come out to 10 million. So we would say, uh, let's go with 2 million daily active users and um, five queries per day on average. Okay, um, so uh, how many um, locations added per day? That's one interesting number. And then uh, how many reads per second? Those are the two interesting numbers. Um, so I said it could go up to 24 hours stale. We'll we'll analyze that a little bit more later um, in terms of um, updating that frequency a bit. Uh, I have some ideas for that. And then um, how many locations per day though? It's it's uh, I I'm, I'm interested in that. And then um, it's easy to tune that to a higher frequency, like every four hours we'll let it update or something. Um, anyways, uh, so we have 500 million locations and a 20% uh, growth rate that comes out to um, 100 million locations added per year. Uh, and then um, per day, so we di divide that by 365, we'll just round it over to 333. Um, so we have 100,000 K, uh, divided by 333. So then I think that would come out to 300. So that would be 300,000 locations added per day. So that still is a pretty high number, but we're allowed to do it a little bit more, uh, stale. Um, we can have our, our data go a bit more stale. So even though it's going to come out to about three writes per second, um, we, we can batch them up. So that way it's not constantly updating the, the uh, index of the database we're going to be using. Um, anyways, that's, our, that's one number that I'm interested in. And then how many reads per second? Uh, we have 2 million daily active users. Um, and uh, five queries per day on average, so that comes out to 10 million reads per day. And then uh, 10 million divided by, we have 100,000 seconds in a day, roughly. Uh, so then that comes out to 100, uh, hold on, uh, 1,000, is that only 100? TPS. I tended for that to be a bit higher. 
Um, $100,010 million. It was, um, yeah, I kind of want a bigger number there. I tried to ballpark these in my head right at the start. I think these are actually, um, so if we had 100,000 per second, 20,000, and then multiply by 100, I don't know, that comes out to 2 million a, okay, we're just gonna say that it's um, 100,000 queries per second. Uh, just because we want a bigger number there and it keeps the problem exciting. Okay, so that's not right. I'll figure out why 2 million did not result in the proper number sometime later, but we want to have that volume to keep the problem interesting. Um, I did the numbers with 1,000 transactions per second uh, earlier is, is what you get off of Alf Shoes numbers. And it was like, that's this kind of low. That doesn't really make it as exciting. You might be able to serve that off a single database instance. Um, so we're just going to do 100,000 here. Okay, um, so we got our interesting numbers. We can go ahead and get into the high-level design. All right, um, so we're gonna have the browser of the end users. And we're also going to have the browser for a business user that's adding a new location. Um, we're gonna make sure that the add new location is uh, different than adding or, or updating their, their business information. When they add a location, it's just specifically adding their um, business. Uh, I want to keep those separate because they, they involve um, different, uh, they're, they're going to involve like different things on the databases. Um, so here we're going to say it's the browser for a business user. And here we're going to have browser of a uh, search user. Okay. And we have the back end for that, which will be over here. We also have a back end for this one over here. Um, so we're going to want to capture the new location and we are going to have a database over here for uh, it's, it's uh, you're gonna capture it in a database and then um, we're gonna have a whole bunch of read replicas. So when it's, uh, when you have such high reads, um, a common pattern is where, um, if, if you're going to do writes, they have to go against the primary, and that has uh, uh, it, uh, that will have um, it'll be like the source of truth, and then you have a bunch of replicas, and then um, your writes have to go off the primary replica, uh, but the reads can come off of this, and they'll just have stale data. So you have a bunch of um, read replicas like this. And uh, you're going to do a write over to the primary, and then it's going to replicate that data out to the read replicas like that. OK, and we're going to have our little request and response there. And we have our request and response there. We should probably dive into the API contracts for this. And then, um, like I said, the reads for this backend can be served off the read replicas. Um, this should probably have an elastic, uh, a load balancer in front of it. So we're going to duplicate this. And so then we're just going to have a load balancer there. I'm going to label these. So we have a load balancer. And then this one is going to be the location um, lookup service or uh yeah we'll just name it that um and this one's going to be location capture service okay are there any questions before uh i'm, I'm going to be changing these components up a little bit more as we keep going um you'll you'll see why later but um any questions before i keep going with this Cool. All right, let's keep going. All right. Um, so uh, where the quad tree comes in is that that's what you use for uh, the index on uh, the databases. 
Um, so uh, normally the index is a B tree, or it might be uh, another one is an R tree. You can also have quad trees. Um, another approach to solving this problem involves using this thing called a geohash. We're not going to go into that at all. I'm just going to stick with the quad tree approach. Uh, actually, I can talk through a little bit about how that works and why we need to do that. Um, to start with, though, we can go with a naive solution where we're just using DynamoDB, and then later in the video, I can talk about why DynamoDB uh, doesn't exactly uh, scale up sufficiently for this problem. Um, so anyways, we got this. This is the primary. It is capturing the write operations, which is going to come out to, um, it should be, uh, it's only like, three TPS writes, so. So it's, it's handling that just fine. Um, and then uh, for the reads though, we have 100,000 transactions per second. Um, and uh, I think there are databases out there that can, I think, handle 100,000 transactions per second, but if we wanna have this running on just commodity hardware, that can scale up and down really easily. Um, we're probably not going to be using that. We're probably going to use a database that's probably handling, um, I, I think, I actually think 10K might have been the most for a top of the line um, database hardware thing. So even if you were using the very best database, I'm not sure if it could do much more than like 12,000 transactions per second. Um, I think 1K is pretty realistic. So we're probably going to need something like 100 databases. Um, so uh, Yeah, so we're going to have about 100 read replicas scaled out like that, and it's a, a primary. And then, um, yeah. OK, so that's how you scale it up. And then um, you're going to have an issue, though, with the, 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 the index you would use by default. Uh, DynamoDB uses a B tree. Um, it's not exactly the most efficient thing you can do. Um, so let's start talking about the schemas a little bit and what these request and responses look like. And then that will expose why this index is not exactly the best approach to go with. Um, so we're just going to be looking at the new location add scenario. They are going to have um, their business name. Let's say it's uh, it's a Shell gas station. Um, I want to support like so. Let's say you're you're looking for you know find nearest gas station, uh, find nearest restaurant or something. You're going to have like categories. So you could have um, a business type here. So I'm going to have type, and it will be uh, it's an e it's it's a string or an enum in the database. It can just be an enum that's more space efficient. If it was a string, that would be um, you would have to talk about how long that string would be. Let's say 100 on average, and then that's 100 characters, 100 bytes. If you're using enum instead, that's an int, which is four bytes instead of 100. So it um it it handles that better if you use an enum. And I don't think we're going to have more than like let's say a few thousand categories, that would probably even be excessive, maybe just a few hundred, you might be able to get away with a short, but um, we're gonna use an enum instead. But uh, coming in, I, I guess it doesn't really matter if it's the actual enum value or the string. Um, ideally, if you wanna be space efficient, you can just use the, the enum int, but it's that's not gonna be where the big um, cost savings are gonna be. Uh, and then we're going to have the location information. So we have the location itself. Uh, we're going to have a latitude and longitude. Lat, long. Let me make this a little bit more readable. Okay, this is the request structure. I have latitude, let's say uh, it's 40.35 and then the longitude uh, can be negative. So we'll have negative uh, 30.74 or something like that. So there's the request and then the response, you're just gonna get a 200 okay. Uh, so you send this request over, sticks it in your database. Uh, so we're gonna call this the uh, location, whoops, location db, let's drag it over here. Uh, and it's going to persist that. And then you get your response back saying, yep, captured it. And then you go ahead and say, okay, over here. Um, later on, we might be able to do some decoupling with a broker, or we could even have a primary capture service. And then we later um, do something else. 
uh, after capturing it for a, a more uh, optimized review or something. We'll get around to it later. Um, but anyways, uh, it says, yep, I got it. And then you just send back a 200 success or something. Um, this should probably be a post request. Um, you can fit it all within a get request, but yeah, it should probably be a post request. Uh, okay, and then over here, uh, we're going to have uh, the request for this, for the lookup side, it's gonna be a request. You're gonna have your current location. Have a flat longitude. And you're gonna have, um, what are you looking for? So we're gonna have um, business type. And again, we're gonna have that uh, enum. Say that we're looking for a gas station. Um, you're allowed to specify a radius of how far out it is. That was something kind of covered in Alex Shue's book. Um, I'm gonna specify that it's a 20 kilometer radius. Okay, and then we can talk about response over here. Should receive back a list of businesses. There will be a list of them. We'll look at one example object. Uh, we'll have a name. Let's see something like Shell. We'll have uh, the specific location. Uh, so that will again be. And these should be sorted. Um, you'll do the sorting on the uh, back end uh, on the location lookup service. Um, yeah, I'll go into that later. Um, so lat, uh, longitude. So here again, we get our uh, details from over there. It'll have the latitude of 40, 0.35, longitude negative. 30.74, okay, so there's the response. Uh, and it'll have multiple businesses like that. It can also have, we'll go ahead and include description. Uh, that'll be something that they would have in the um, update your business information part after the add business information part. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so description. Um, this is a Shell gas station. We also have a convenience store. I don't know what there is to say about a Shell, but there's a, there's one example. Um, so for that, there's also going to be a business information database, which is separate. Let's talk about yeah, we'll, we'll have a business information DB. Um, this one's not really the interesting aspect of this problem. Okay, and we got location DB over here. So first it gets, so when you send in the request, it's gonna hit the load balancer. The load balancer finds a service, uh, a machine. This is horizontally scaled, of course. Um, that'll be a fun thing to, to do some estimations on. Um, so the load balancer finds one machine within the horizontally scaled service. Uh, it makes a call to the location DB. When I talk about location DB, it is actually all of these. Um, normally I don't um, do the, illustrate the replicas specifically, but this is an interesting problem for scale um, in terms of read replicas. I'm even going to change this up later. Um, so it does that. It uh, fetches a list of locations from location DB, and then it gets the rest of the business information from uh, business information DB. So that is part two. So first, so one, fetch the locations. Then we have two, which is the business information DB. And uh, having that separate just allows us to keep the location DB really slim with a lot less information. So now all we need in location DB is a uh, business ID, which will be like a number like one, two, three, four. And then we'll have the latitude and the longitude. So latitude, 
uh, we will have 40.35 and we'll have negative 35.74. Um, that's really all we need. And then um, with the other one, that's where you can have, um, that's where you can have the, the name of the business. That's where you have um, shell, have your uh, fancy um, description. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, there are some other things they listed off in there, but let's just imagine that, you know, it's going to be a few hundred bytes. Um, you might have some large objects in there. Uh, you might have some links to some pictures of the place. Um, we don't want to focus on that aspect for this problem. We mainly just want to dive into location DB. Um, quickly going to that aside a little bit more, we could talk about how um, second we could have could actually make this a little bit bigger and then we would just have um, this one making two calls. Um, I'd prefer to have it as two separate steps though, where like you might have a form they're filling out and the first one just goes ahead and gets into the location DB. Um, and then the second one goes ahead and gets it all the way into the business information DB. So you would have like a second thing where you are doing the business information update service. And then that one is where we are going to uh, persist the data all the way to here. Let's bend to this thing. And it'll send a response back and then you get your 200 okay. Uh, so they have uh, two calls when they're filling out the business information. One is the location capture service for the first service call. Then they click like the, the next button or something. They go on the next page, fill out some stuff. And then you got your second service call over here for the, the rest of the information. We have your pictures, your description, all that stuff. Okay. Um, talk about the DB size a bit. Um, so we're going to have more than 500 uh, million locations in here. Um, we can go ahead and start talking about why a normal B tree solution. Um, so we, we can we can assume that like for now, uh, we were assuming that um, current DB choice is um, Dynamo DB. And uh, Dynamo DB uses B trees. Um, so the way that an index kind of works is that. Um, you got your, your machine. Um, so this is like your, your, um, your server. And then you've got uh, hard drive. And then you've got the RAM up here. So you got E, you got the RAM. And uh, all your data is in the HDD. And then every time you do an index, you go ahead and add a new um, tree and it actually the the trees for the index are actually in RAM. Each tree is in RAM. So let's say you have the the primary key index. So you would have the uh, primary key uh, B tree, and then you add another secondary index. So we would say that we have the lat B tree, and then you have the longitude B tree. So we're going to say that we have the lat. B tree. LSM trees are interesting because the LSM tree is just right on the disk. Um, there might be some different tricks that it does in RAM. I think when you read the tree off of the hard drive into RAM, it's then called a mem table. Uh, don't quote me on that. I should probably read the big table white paper or something to completely get that down. But I think it's a mem table in RAM, and then you just dump it to disk, and then it's called a, an SS table. Um, and within those tables are an LSM tree. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, and then we're going to have the longitude B tree over here. And so the issue is that we have um, 500 million locations. And then for the latitude B tree, they're all sorted by the latitude, all 500 million locations. For the longitude, they're sorted by the longitude. Um, we can talk a bit about how big those B trees are going to be. So it's 500 million locations. Um, how big is the B tree? Um, so uh, 
500 million locations. Each record is going to be uh, three integers, or you've got two floats and one integer, so that's three numbers. Uh, three numbers per record, uh, an int is four bytes, four bytes per number. So that comes out to uh, 12 bytes per record. We've got 500 million locations times 12 bytes. You get, uh, uh, let's round it up to 20 bytes per record. So then that comes out to 1 billion, 2 billion, 2 billion bytes um, of data, um, which is equivalent to 2 million uh, kilobytes, you get uh, 2,000 uh, megabytes, and you have 2 gigabytes. So each B tree is going to be about two gigabytes if you have the whole record. Usually you don't store the whole record in the B tree. The B tree usually has um, whatever it, it'll have. Um, for the primary key, you would just have uh, this. So we're gonna say that our primary key is the business ID. So you just have that, and then you'd have a pointer to wherever the rest of the record is on the hard drive. Uh, so that would be one int for the business ID and a second int for uh, the pointer to where it is on disk. Uh, you can do a thing called a concatenated index or it's a clustered index. I think it's called a clustered index where you can have extra uh, attributes in that record. So since ours is so small, we might as well just do a, I think it's called a clustered index on like the whole record and then you'll just have all three attributes in it. And so then your B tree would actually have the whole record there. Um, and it might even have the pointer as well. And so we might actually have four ints there. And so then we would, uh, we already had rounded up to 20 bytes, but then in that case, it would be 16 bytes to include the pointer as well. And so we're still comfortably fitting the whole thing with 20 bytes for uh, all the data plus a pointer to where it is on disk, which is not necessary anymore since it's the whole record. Um, but so each of these B trees we will say is um, two gigabytes. And you know you can easily get um, eight gigabytes of RAM. It's even becoming common to have uh, sixteen gigabytes of RAM on a you know your own personal laptop. Um, so that all fits perfectly fine and dandy within your RAM. But the issue is that when you when you have these indexes and you're looking it up by just one at a time, you're it only speeds it up along one dimension. While if we're doing location lookup where um, we're trying to have both of these. Uh, we're looking up both of these at the same time. So we, we might kind of want to talk about how that SQL query looks over here. I can type it out really quick. Um, you're going to do uh, select star where um, type equals uh, gas station um, and lat is greater than um, what, 40 plus 10. It's greater than 40 minus 10 kilometers and flat is less than 40 plus 10 km and longitude is greater than uh, negative 35 plus 10 km. I realize I'm switching between different units here. It is a little bit like pseudocode because um, this is degrees of latitude and longitude while this one's kilometers. Uh, just bear with me on that. Uh, and less than negative 35 uh, minus plus 10 kilometers. So you have these and you're, this, is your, these, this is your filtering through the records. And so um, we might have another B tree on the type, I guess, but we're still pretty comfortable on the RAM um, at eight gigabytes. And then um, so we'd filter by that, but then for these other clauses, you would just be filtering along the latitude. You're not filtering by both at the same time. So you'd first filter for a list of things along the latitude. So if you look at a map, you know, let's say this is a map of the world. When you're doing your latitude filter, I might be mixing up latitude and longitude. 
you'd have a filter along this whole strip of the globe. And then you'd also have uh, for the other one in latitude and longitude, you would filter it alternatively along the other. But in your first filter of that bee tree, you're retrieving a slice along the whole world like this. And so you're kind of doing a full, it's, it's not quite a full table scan. That's why you add, you have to manually add an index for the latitude and longitude as well, a secondary indexes. And what you're doing is that then you have these other bee trees added. That's, that's what these second, these, these are secondary indexes. You add a secondary index, you're adding more bee trees and RAM. But uh, with how this is, uh, when you do that first filter for latitude, you only have, um, you're only filtering it down to all the locations within this whole strip along the world. You're not narrowing it down to these, which is what we want in the end result. And so that's why uh, quad tree is what comes in. And it's, it's actually just another index, just like this. Um, another approach is uh, you, you can have other types of indices. Like there's, there's also, um, there's R trees. Uh, you can do this trick called a space filling curve or it's like Hilbert space. It's covered really briefly in um, Alex Shue's book. Um, it's where you do a conversion from two attributes into one, you kind of combine the latitude and longitude attribute into a, a third one that you calculate. And then you're able to treat it as one dimension. That's how you're, you're narrowing it down along both at the same time is that you've done a mathematical conversion between two dimensions to one. So uh, there's the Hilbert um, space filling curve. And so then that's actually technically still using a B tree. So, um, but it's a B tree of one attribute that covers two. Um, you have quad trees, which is what we're gonna use. Um, and then um, I think there's a few others. I can't really think of them. It's like B plus trees, B star trees, which are just variations of B trees. I think there's some other ones out there. Oh, there's the skip list thing. So with, with Redis, where you have the um, Redis sorted set slash skip list, it's just skip list and it's another type of index. Um, so if we had like an R tree or something instead, we would just have that. That's, that's all you're doing there. Um, but instead, what we want is a quad tree. So we're going to use a special type of index. Uh, so you can have, um, you can also do like a concatenated index, which is where you, you make one where it's um, lat dash longe, but that is not actually working the same way as you, you want to filter along. What we want is that lat and longitude as separate things instead of, um, Concatenated index is when you literally concatenate the launch to the end of the latitude. That's not what you want. Um, yeah, so we're going to make a quad tree. It's going to look in the physical machine like. Um, let me get text. Okay, so you have lat and longitude and it's called quad tree. I think that R trees similarly um, work on uh, two things at once. Um, and then uh, it's also still gonna manage to come out to just two gigabytes. Um, so B trees are, are it's it, it looks like a tree. Uh, quad trees are just a special tree where um, so you have this big grid of data. So um, I'm, I'm gonna tell you about how uh, the quad tree works. So you have all these locations on a world map, and then um, you want to recursively split the squares until you have just 100, um, 100 locations, 100 businesses within a single square. So like this is a world map, and then you split it into four um, spots like that, and then um, let's say uh, these two somehow only have 100, uh, they, they already have less than 100 um, businesses in them, but these other ones don't. So then we need to further split the other ones into uh, smaller sections just like that. 
And then um, we find out that um, these three squares still are uh, too big. So you're still just going to split them just like that. And you continue doing this until each square has only uh, 100 businesses each, for example, as a stopping criteria. Uh, this is covered in Al Chu's book. And then um, I think each box is like a node in the quad tree. Um, and that's how you build it out. Uh, but it's an index. It's a little bit less. It's, it's almost underwhelming compared to Paxos and Raft, where you almost have like dedicated machines on it. Um, so uh, a quad tree, it's just a type of index. It goes in RAM. Um, that's all you really need to know. Some, uh, some types of uh, database software actually handle it for you. Um, so for example, Elasticsearch actually has quad trees built in. So for our database, uh, we are actually going to switch over to um, quad trees, uh, Elasticsearch. Whoops, it's getting mixed up there on words. Uh, I thought it had a strike through over here somewhere. We're just going to use uh, the markdown no notation. So not that one. What we want is um, Elasticsearch, which has a built-in implementation of quad trees. So you actually don't even have to code up quad trees. Um, some database solutions actually have it for you. For example, Elasticsearch. So we're just kind of forced into Elasticsearch here. Yeah, so uh, first database, it receives Elasticsearch. It's, it receives the right. It sends it out to all of its replicas. Um, but rebuilding those replicas might be really expensive. Uh, so I can show you how we can kind of um, set this up so that we just have a daily rebuild of our index. We only ingest the, all the new data like once per day or something like that. Um, we might actually run out of time since it's 3645. Uh, let's go ahead and check if there's any more questions before I try and show you how I can um, set this up into a once per day operation. No questions? Um, sorry, I had a question. Um, just going over the indexes, right? How would the data look like? On the on the indexes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are it's it's a uh, on the B tree. It is actually like a tree, so you like do actually have like nodes where um, you know you have. Um, these are optimized, B trees are optimized for how uh, how big a cache page is. And so B trees are really flat. And I think they have something like um, 60 nodes per uh, per tree or something. And so it's it usually only gets about five to six layers deep on a B tree. Um, and then you have your records all the way at the bottom. And so B trees are like super long and um, flat. And so it almost looks like it's, it looks more like a gigantic hash table at the first level or like sharded at the first level. And then at the bottom is, um, and uh, the, the pointers on these tree, um, you're, you're organizing all the nodes of the tree by the value that you're choosing to sort them over. So for, uh, let's say this is the first B tree, this is our primary key. And so you're sorting these all within the B tree using um, the business ID. Um, it, it's uh, for latitude or longitude, it's the same idea, but of course you're just sorting them all by latitude within this. And this contains, um, like I said, uh, since the records are so small, you would actually be able to have all the data in the leaf nodes just, um, just with two, two gigabytes of RAM. So you can literally fit all the data in all these records here at the bottom with just two gigabytes. And then these ones uh, up here, the, the trees, the, the intermediary nodes, um, they don't have any records attached to them. Um, they just are, um, it's just like, here's the pointers. Uh, you, you like filter it down by a range. And so we have a range that's between um, 40 and 45 or the latitude, or we would say the, the business ID is between 40 and 50. And so then we see that uh, those values are within this range of the B tree. And then we would say, uh, here's 40, uh, here is 41, and here is record 43. And then this would just have all the data for that record, as well as a pointer to disk. 
Um, and if you weren't storing the whole record there, it would have the value of that node. So for example, it would be 41 is the primary key, but I don't have the latitude and longitude on uh, in RAM. I just have that and then a pointer to disk. So it would just have um, business ID is 41. Here's a pointer to disk. And then you would go and you would do a read off of disk of that little strip within the hard drive, just like that. Um, quad trees will look different. It won't be as flat. Um, to my understanding is that you have the root node for the whole world. And then um, each layer, I think you would have four nodes since you're dividing into four continuously. And then, um, like I said, we would have the first and the fourth nodes have 100, um, have uh, 100 restaurants uh, each in them or 100, it has 100 businesses in each somehow, um, but the middle two uh, do not. So those ones uh, each need uh, split out into um, four records. Uh, it'll do uh, four here. And then um, we've got, I'll copy these, just paste them down there. We can pretend like they're all lined up. Actually, that came out pretty close. So now we can say um, the first three all have 100 each. Uh, this one has more, so we'd split that one further. Um, so it looks like this one's going to be a lot longer while a B tree is really flat and really wide. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Uh, the graphics that Alex Shu had in his second book for explaining B trees were really solid. I'd also recommend checking out his uh, his YouTube channel. Might have some good explanations for quad trees going further. Um, I think you you won't be expected to explain how a quad tree works in an interview, to my understanding. But I definitely wanted to capture this part right here, which I think Alex Shu did not cover which is how uh, indexes work out with RAM and disk. When you add a new index, you're just adding a new tree in memory uh, like that. Okay, cool. All right, any other questions before I keep going? All right, um, so now I'm actually gonna do something really crazy. Um, I don't think they cover this they, Alex Shu hardly covered this. He, he hardly covered this. Uh, none of them covered. He talked about blue-green rollouts a little bit, um, but I, I'm not happy with how he covered how you will make the updates work. He, he did not cover them really much at all. So you're going to have a capture database, and um, this one is, is not really going to need to have... Um, it's, it's really not going to need to have all those indexes in on it. It's a uh, uh, okay, here we go. So we're going to call this the location. It's the capture DB. This is where I'm really doing my own stuff here. Uh, so we have this capture DB. You just got to get it into there and then it returns a success. And then uh, we're actually going to add an extra attribute here. We're going to add a timestamp here for our update so that we know um, what all we uh, you can actually use Cassandra on this one. It's uh, the index is, is not important at all for the capture DB. Uh, why did I do that? I can just go ahead and move these over here. So we are going to use um, Cassandra. Come on, we are going to use Cassandra. It's fine if we go a little bit over seven o'clock today. Uh, and I want to have a timestamp. The timestamp is actually what's going to get indexed. I don't care about indexing either of these for Cassandra. I just want to. And have um I want to have this as a secondary index, and uh, you can do consistent hashing or something on this. It doesn't really matter. It's probably going to end up doing scatter gather, but you're going to batch up a whole bunch of stuff, and every day, uh, every night, or every six hours or something, uh, you are going to copy it over to the other ones. We have this secondary index, and then um. We have a crap load of replicas, just a ton of them. Uh, it looks like we would maybe need like a hundred or something like that. And um, you're still gonna do your reads off of that, which totally made sense. Um, but it's how are we going to get this data into those read replicas? How are we gonna move it over? Uh, he mentioned blue green deployments. I like rolling deployments. So we're going to have our replica scaled up to, uh, let's say that we need n mini servers for handling the amount of reads. We want n plus one or even two if you wanna have the rolling update go even faster. And we're gonna have some task runners that are going to uh, 
update them. It's going to handle the rolling update. And um, I think we are going to have a status table. Uh, we're going to have um, a status table of, um, uh, so this will have, this will be the status table DB. And the way that this is going to work is that you'll have your DB instance ID. And we'll say that uh, this is, for example, uh, NA3. So then in our DB instance, it'll be marked as uh, NA3. And we'll be recording um, last update uh, time. And it'll be a timestamp of the last time we copied data over into it. And then um, every single day, um, I had this like message queue thing going over here. Uh, you could do like rabbit and queue or something. And so then like every day you would have, um, at the end of the day, you would add 100 plus one messages into there for the corresponding IDs. I don't know if that actually really made that much sense. It's just, I didn't wanna have one Lambda function handling the whole thing of the whole rollover because then it would be a little bit messier. Um, but what you're gonna have is you'll have a message coming in of a specific, uh, whatever node it is. Uh, so that's step one. And then, um, okay. And then you're going to uh, fetch the timestamp off of the status table. You are going to fetch the status off the status table at the last update timestamp. Um, and then you're going to use that last update timestamp as the filter over here. Notice we index that so we can easily figure out what records have been added since our last update. And you're gonna fetch those records off of that since that timestamp. And then those are the records that you're going to need to persist over into here. So you've gathered them up and then you persist all of them. That's the fourth operation. And then the very last thing you're gonna do is you're going to mark that you've updated it. That's operation five. And this whole thing is item potent. The whole thing is item potent. So if the task runner goes down at any point while handling the message, uh, we, we can go ahead and just use RabbitMQ over here, which is uh, handles the fault tolerance within it. And so then um, if it, it would just try to rerun the same message off the task runner and just go for the same thing. But then you are only updating one host one, uh, one of the read replicas at a time. And um, we have n plus one read replicas where n is the number sufficient for handling all read volume. So then we're overscaled by just the amount that we're gonna use for, um, uh, we're overscaled by just the amount that we're going to be doing for our uh, uh, rollout or uh, rolling release pace. And you can actually do n plus two if you want to update two databases at a time. So uh, if you do n plus two, you can go ahead and have two task runners taking on two messages from here at once. And so you have the first one handling this one, and you can have the second one handling a different one over here. But since you're scaled at n plus two, when these two DBs are offline, uh, taking in the new data and then rebuilding their pod tree, they're not gonna be serving up any reads. And so you still have n nodes left for handling all that read traffic. Um, so there was nothing like this in any of Alex Shu's content. It wasn't in uh, grokking. Uh, Alex Shu touched on doing a blue-green deployment. A blue-green is when you would have n nodes that are currently serving up reads. You spin up an n additional amount of uh, DB instances. And then they would, um, you know, these n additional ones that are then going to be the, the blue copy instead of the green copy that's currently hot. And then after the blue copy is fully built, you would flip over to the blue copy. But that's really expensive because you have to have an entire uh, 2n databases online while you're uh, uh, copying over all the data and building the index, which might be like an hour or something. And so that's uh, more expensive for operations. But usually when, when all that Amazon, we, we liked doing um, for, for the backend services, we usually did rolling releases where it was just updating one at a time. And so you would just be overscaled by N plus one. Uh, um, and then normally it, it's fine to have these even at N plus one as well, just in case one host just somehow 
malfunctions for some reason goes offline. So it might actually even be make sense to have um, n plus one under, under normal scenarios, but under you'd have n plus two for safely handling those rolling releases because the first one, n plus one, is for hey, what if one of the DBs just gets knocked out for whatever reason, just due to malfunctioning? And then n plus two, the second one, is for handling this rolling release. Yeah. Any questions on that? That was probably really complex. Okay. Well, so that's what that's how I would handle the rolling releases. Um, that uh, I might have glossed over some aspect, or there's something hacky about it. Um, you might. I don't know if you really need RabbitMQ here. I know you can set up Lambda functions as task runners and they can function as a cron job just fine on their own. I wasn't sure how you could batch it up so that um, you would um, have them self start. Like if, if you removed this chunk and had it as a cron job, I would be worried about them all booting up at once and just taking down your whole fleet. Um, so I wasn't sure about how best to handle that. There's some aspects in here that I think maybe be done a little bit more directly or a little bit less hacky. So this is this is the area that I'm, I'm the most concerned about in my whole design. Um, oh, right. So this is Cassandra, but over here, you'd still be using Elasticsearch. And uh, so this one would actually have um, different indexes than uh, this replica. So over here, your read replica would actually be an entirely different, uh, an entirely different DB solution, an entirely different indexing approach than um, your uh, your uh, capture service. So this whole thing that is going to be uh, a secondary index of a quad tree. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to post this all, of course, on uh, on the channel for you guys to ask questions. I think I'm just going to start up one of those forum discussion posts, and I'll, of course, upload this on YouTube as well. Um, last call for questions. Why would you use uh, Cassandra's DE, the second DB? Why not DynamoDB? Um, good question. Good question. So it's going to be very heavy write operations. So this actually has now flipped it entirely off of being read heavy. These are still read heavy, but this one is actually now probably going to be write heavy hilariously. Um, so it, it actually does make sense to have an LSM tree there because you're going to be having an average of uh, one TPS to 10, uh, 10 TPS of writes. And then um, that uh, the read side on the read side, it's just off that Lambda task runner. And so then you have, what is it? 100 reads daily. Yeah. And so then you, you're just getting 100 reads in total per day while this one is getting um, 300,000 writes per day or something. So you might actually only need like uh, one or two Cassandra instances like total. Uh, like like two or three machines total of Cassandra DB instances, and you would be handling this part just fine. Um, and then uh, it's only 100 reads per day because it's just the task runner. So uh, it's it's it it is actually write heavy in this in this case. Another uh, another choice might be a time series database. So uh, maybe a time series. DB, but in that case, you would want to put Cassandra out front or some kind of message broker since that's not optimized for availability. Cassandra is very optimized for availability. Um, so that's fine. So if you use a time series DB, though, you should definitely put a message broker out front. Um, you, I don't even know if you would need Kafka there, um, Kafka or Kinesis. You might be able to get away with just RabbitMQ as the, the broker, and then you would have the time series DB just similarly just off over here you would read directly off the time series DB. Um, so that's another option, but it is actually going to be right heavy. Very good question. Very good question, thanks. Any other questions?
Okay, well, we can go ahead and end it. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the Discord channel. I'm, of course, going to upload this to YouTube as well, so you guys can walk through a little bit more slowly. Um, this is where I was doing all the innovative stuff. Uh, I'd, I, I'm looking forward to seeing any, any criticism of it. I'm definitely looking forward to anything uh, in regards to criticism. Nobody else is, everyone else glossed over the details of how you're going to handle that. Uh, handle that deployment. I, I didn't want to do that though. Um, this is a, that's a real system there. <laughs> All right. You guys go ahead and have a nice evening. I'll have the second session in a little bit over three hours, about three and a half hours. Uh, I'll let you guys go though. Thanks.